Good morning, everyone. My name is Gloria. And my name is Tabitha. And this morning, it is really our joy to be able to share with you our inspirations of praise. You know, before we do, let us bow our heads and come to the Lord in prayer. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we are able to come to your house this morning. In good health, we thank you that you've been with us through our travels, for those who have been traveling, and brought us home safely. Father, we thank you that we can still come into your house, and we pray that you would please still our hearts and our minds, Lord, to hear your word and take heed of what you want to say to us today. I pray, Lord, and ask that our praise would be acceptable in your sight this morning. In Jesus' most precious and worthy name, amen. So our first song for this morning is hymn number two, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. You know, as Tabitha and I prepared to lead in worship this morning, we found that we really identify with what the author was writing in reference to salvation in the Lord. You know, it's really such a great blessing that we are able to find salvation, that even in our wandering, when we were lost in sin, the Lord Jesus would still come down and reach out to us and free us and be that light in our darkness to guide us back to him. In stanza three, it says, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. As we thought about how indebted we are to the Lord for his amazing grace, we are really drawn to desire to have a closer relationship to him. You know, from the initial blessing of having salvation, we also have other added blessings. So it's kind of like a dominoes effect where the one blessing triggers more blessings in our lives. You know, because we are saved and because we have faith in the Lord, we have a church family. As evident in our recent anniversary celebration, faith and salvation in the Lord can bring people together to celebrate such wonderful blessings. One of the events that I really appreciated was the Thursday night's worship service. You know, here we were able to see the words and stands of one come alive, where it sings, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Really the volume of praise that night was something that I truly don't take for granted. It's really encouraging to see when so many people lift their voices to the Lord with, in praise. And this morning, Gloria and I would like to invite you all to sing with us our first song with as much joy and excitement to the Lord, reflecting on his abundant blessings in our lives. Thank you for your singing. So this theme for this month, To You I Will Pray, is a really challenging one for me. You know, learning how David prayed in Psalm 16 has shown me aspects of prayer that I was not conscious of in relation to my prayer with the Lord. You know, the aspect that really stood out to me was how David had a close relationship with God. You know, prayer is something that was introduced to me when I was a child, and it was introduced to me from my parents, my Sunday school teachers, and from the pastors. And as far as I knew, there were five kinds of prayers. So the first was mealtime prayers, when we would thank God for the food and ask him to bless the food to our bodies. Um, the second was when my parents would pray with my sister and I before we went to school so that we would have a safe day and also so that we would make the right choices when we were at school. The third was prayers asking for help from the Lord when we had trouble dealing with people or when we had when we were struggling with a task at hand. The fourth prayer was prayers that I heard in church, so from pastors and our Sunday school teachers, when they would pray that we, our hearts would be inclined to his word and that we would understand his word too. And lastly, um, nighttime prayers, when our parents would pray with us and we would close the day thinking about the Lord's goodness and thanking him for 
taking care of us that day. So when I came to God in prayer, he was always like a fixer to me. You know, every time I came to him, I could trust that he would fix my problems. You know, and at the end of the day, I would always thank him for, you know, the problems that he had fixed. And it seemed to me that I had a very simple relationship with the Lord, but it was really quite a selfish kind of prayer life when I would always ask God to fix my problems and not really take responsibility for the life I was living. You know, even when I grew to know more of the Lord and his grace and his love through his word and through the life of Christ, you know, I would still have this mentality that he was a fixer and he was there to fix my problems. And, you know, the more I heard of God's righteousness and the more I realized how far away I was from that righteousness, you know, the more I asked of God to fix my life and to help me to overcome my struggles. You know, my prayer list grew so long that all throughout the day, every single prayer that I made was to help me fix something. And I didn't really take time to thank the Lord or even reflect on the things that he wanted me to do, whether it was his guidance or his instruction. And there were many times when I even caught myself being impatient with the Lord because I struggled with my own inconsistencies. You know, in Psalm 16, verse 2, David writes, O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. You know, it really shows his regard for the Lord as a master and David his servant. You know, as I compared this relationship and reflection that David had to my own prayer life, I'm really ashamed of the way that I pray and my relationship with the Lord. You know, David humbled his heart to seek the Lord for his guidance and his counsel. And he would set aside his own desires to seek God's guidance and the path of life. And in placing the Lord always before him, in Psalm 16 verse nine, David was able to find fullness of joy and rest in hope saying, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also rests in hope. Our next hymn for this morning is hymn number 198, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. You know, it is this wonderful grace of Jesus that we can have hope and find this same fullness of joy. In the last verse, it says, wonderful grace of Jesus reaching the most defiled by its transforming power, making him God's dear child. Purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. I'm reminded that even as I strive to build this closer relationship with the Lord and understanding God's desires for me, it's founded on this wonderful grace of Jesus that has purchased the peace and hope in heaven, even for someone like me. So please take this next song with us. Thank you all for your singing. <clears throat> so when I was younger, I always thought that prayer was pretty cool because I was taught that God could listen to me wherever I may be or whenever I needed to just speak to someone. I always thought that it was pretty amazing that this great God could hear me, whether I was praying out loud, or if I was just thinking these words in my mind. A lot like the song we sang for our pre-worship. Now that I understand a little bit more about how prayer works, I still think it's cool, but for deeper reasons. Our theme taken from Psalm 5 verse 2 reads, Give heed to the voice of my cry, my God and my King, for to you I will pray. As I reflected over this psalm, I was really inspired by how David was so driven with desire to seek God daily, more specifically in the morning. In verse three he says, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up. 
You know, there was a sense of determination that David had. And the psalmist goes on to give substance to why he sought God the way he did. He recognized God as a righteous and merciful king who gives guidance and protection to those who seek him with such an earnest heart. David truly went through some challenging times as noted throughout the Psalms. Whether it was him literally running away from his enemies or from being overwhelmed by distress, David was constantly learning more about how practical applications of faith, such as prayer, could really impact and greatly benefit his life. Something that really inspires me was that no matter how challenging his circumstance was, he was driven to seek God with tremendous trust. This inspires me because, you know, from time to time I still struggle to turn straight to God when going through difficulties. I can sometimes find myself using my own wisdom to solve the things in front of me instead of turning to the one who has all the wisdom and the answers. But seeing how David's life played out and how he sought God in prayer in the Psalms reminded me of God's everlasting presence in our lives when we do seek him. You know, for myself, I don't particularly have a difficult life or a difficult set of struggles. My day-to-day -day really just consists of waking up, going to work, doing some exercise and going home. So it's not a very difficult life. But something that brings me a great deal of assurance is knowing that you know, if and when things in my life or the people's lives around me become challenging like David's life, that God could do the same work in my life through prayer. This psalm really does tell a beautiful story of how prayer can be such a blessing in your life when you are seeking God and you call out to him in prayer. However, for now, I'm just learning to seek God to guide me for when these times come. And I pray that in these circumstances, that they'll simply just point me to God's direction for his guidance as a first priority, to seek him for strength, for renewal, and for assurance that can only come through prayer, just as David did. Our last song today is HWC 430, I Must Tell Jesus. All four stanzas of this song describes a really wonderful relationship. It sings, I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. You know, truly, we are blessed to even be able to sing these words, that we can even come to Jesus and to tell him what we struggle with in life and the things that burden us. And as we sing this song, and prepare our hearts for Holy Communion later. Can we appreciate our salvation and the Lord's Jesus' love for us afresh? So I invite you all to stand as we sing our third hymn for this morning. Thank you all for your singing. You may be seated. And I'll pass this time over to Pastor Chris. Okay, just want to uh, say, okay, you've got to turn this back on. Great, thank you. Just want to uh, greet you uh, in person. Uh, I was away last week, just glad to be back, and it's good to be uh, back in the Lord's house to worship with you. It's so good to just sing uh, those hymns that we love so much, that speaks of the Lord, that sings of prayer. Okay, and um, just wanted to uh, highlight a few things for you also, that we have uh, two friends with us from Singapore, from Bethany. This is uh, Su Ling and Lily. We'll say hello to them. Wave so we know where you are. <laughs> they were here for our 20th anniversary, weren't you? I remember you were here for the 20th. And they have come back to a little holiday here in Perth to see how wonderful weather we have in spring. <laughs> uh, they enjoy the cold. Okay, well, we're glad that you can worship with us here. Well, we're going to pray for a while, and we're going to think of a number of things. Thank, thankful that we can have this wonderful privilege called prayer, and we will be uh, listening, studying, taking up this topic later in the message. We want to pray for our brethren over in India. Next Sunday, 
uh, I will be, after the worship service, that is, I will be going over to India. And they will be celebrating their church anniversary. And, uh, uh, and also uh, the wedding of Titus. Some of us who know Titus, and he is getting married. So we are going to remember him in prayer especially. And we take nothing for granted, especially Indian weddings, because you don't know the person till three months from knowing the person from day one to getting married or in three months. <sighs> yes. Dating? What is dating? <laughs> so, and you're going to live for the rest of your life together. That is, and, and it works, and it works somehow. But we will remember him in prayer uh, especially. I said to him, I will go there to be uh, celebrating the anniversary, and I'll also be there to encourage him. He has been my translator all these years that I have uh, been in India to take from children all the way to young people, still taking the young people in family camp, and he's been my translator. So I thought I would do that part to be there in person to encourage him. Well, let it always be personal when we think of each other in prayer. Let's pray together for a while. Our Father, we thank you that we can be in fellowship with you in prayer. We thank you that we can remember our brethren overseas as well, for Bethany in their a and project, that you would be there for them to encourage, to lift up their heart, that they will continue to see this project to the end through prayer. We think of our brethren over in India as well, and in the celebration of their church anniversary, we ask for your blessings to be given to them. And they will rejoice much in seeing your work in their lives. That we think of the pastor Titus as he prepares for marriage, that you would bless as the future leadership of our church in India. May you be there to lead and guide. We pray that you would be with us. May we learn deep lessons of prayer this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take up a Bible memory verse before we take up this message that we have prepared for us this morning. In Psalm 25, verse 5, there are two very special gifts that God gives to us, and we all have this, or we all can have this, that we must treasure. One is prayer. The other is the Word of God. Without the Word of God, how do we know how to pray? How do we know how to, what guides us to call upon God? And I'm grateful to the word of God. Psalm 25 actually is a very precious, a dear psalm to my own heart. This prayer has been made many times. When I'm in the crossroads of life. When I need to make a decision that is critical. This prayer has become mine. Psalm 25 verse 5. Well, let's read this together. Let's recite it. If we've committed to memory, wonderful. It is a wonderful prayer to make. Okay, well, let's try this together. Psalm 25, verse 5. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. And that has been a prayer that I make, that God would lead me in his truth. Which way should I go? There are many paths in life. How shall I walk? This was a prayer that was made. Lord, lead me. And it has to be in your truth. Because I know that if I walk in truth, the Lord will bless. Why would God hear this prayer? Second statement. You are the God of my salvation. That's the reason why God would hear. You are related to him in this way. He is the God of your salvation. He would hear. What is my part? Wait. Trust, exercise faith. And that is not an easy thing to do, to wait, I must say. 
but there is something that must be learned. On you, I wait all the day. Okay, well, let this prayer be an encouragement to our heart this morning as we uh, take time to commit it to memory and make it our own. Okay, this morning we're going to take up Psalm 28, not far from Psalm 25, and we're going to take a look at this prayer of David. Okay, and there are many lessons of prayer that we do want to learn. Ultimately, prayer is personal. How do you learn to pray? By praying. You can ask people to pray for you, and that's fine, that's good. But until you pray, you don't learn the right lessons. You see, David was king of Israel. Samuel, the servant of God, was the man, the prophet, who is to watch over Israel in prayer. And it would be fine for Samuel to pray for David, and he did. He did. But David brought it upon himself to make prayer personal. He personally practiced it, and hence we have so many psalms. And there are many lessons that need to be learned in prayer. And unless we pray, we will not learn them. So when you ask me to pray for you, I will pray, but I hope you pray. I really hope so. Because the person who will be learning lessons of God, of faith, will be the person who prays. Take a look at this psalm, and there is a vital lesson to learn. Psalm 28 verse 1. It's very similar to Psalm 5, very similar. Psalm 5 says, to you I will pray, right? Here's another expression. Verse 1 we read, to you I will cry, O Lord my rock. Note the personal part, I will pray. I will cry. So should the pastor pray for you if you ask him to? But you must pray. Because if you pray, you will learn the lessons. Your heart will be blessed. The person who prays, the person who actually does it, bless is that person. Okay, And, and David experienced the Lord's blessings and through learning lessons. Otherwise, he would not have learned if he did not practice prayer. So my encouragement to all of us this morning is personally do it. Do you pray? It's wonderful to have our parents pray for us if you're younger. It is. But when you come of age, pray. Right? Don't say, I don't know how to pray. Do it. Try. You will learn along the way. There are many lessons. It is a learning experience. Moses did not become a man of prayer from day one. He didn't. You read, he, he didn't know what to do. He didn't even know how to take off his sandals. He learned many lessons along the way until he became an intercessor for Israel. Can you imagine the lives of a million people dependent on one person who prayed? What if you are needed to pray and the life depends on you? I would learn to pray. The servant of God must learn to pray. Because lives are at stake. But people, all of us, must learn these lessons well. And this is, for, this is an example. David is an example. He's a good example because, you see, David was, please do not think David was a perfect person. He had no sins. He had sins. Did he struggle? He struggled. He was disturbed by many things. He faced many difficulties in life. He did not have a bed of roses for his life. He faced many enemies. He had many anxieties, many worries in his life. And so, naturally, for all who are in leadership roles, you will always have many. Everyone wants to be a leader. Everyone wants to be the head. The more you have responsible for, the more worries you will have. Right? To those who are in such uh, responsibility. 
But you know what? It drove him to pray. That is what I admire about David, was his closeness of relationship with God. And that's what prayer helps us to do. It gives to us, it helps us build a relationship that is close with God. And I like Psalm 28 because it tells me just how close his relationship is with God. So close that the thing that bothered him most, you know what it is? Was God's silence. Huh? I wonder if God's silence bothers you. Or you don't even know he's silent. You see, that tells you how close you are with God. When a person you are close with, they are silent. Hey, something is up. Like my wife, if she's silent to me, she, she's silent. Are you okay, dear? Something bothering you? Hope it's not me. <laughs> right? Because it's closeness. Now, if you don't know the person, the person is silent sitting there. You may think the person is mute. You don't know whether maybe the person doesn't like talking. Maybe you don't know. You see, what bothered, what disturbed David, what drove David to pray in Psalm 28 is God's silence. Let's take a look. He says, to you I will cry. Oh Lord, my rock, something, something is up, isn't it? He's disturbed in his heart. Is it enemy coming again? Is it? Is it because he's worrying about something? What is disturbing David? And we read, this is what disturbed David. Do not be silent to me. Did you know that this is what disturbed him? I wonder whether God's silence disturbed us. It tells us how close we are to God. If God is silent to you, would you actually know he's silent? Or would you don't even know he's silent? You would ignore it. David did not ignore it. It bothered him. It bothered him so much, he says these words. Lest if you are silent to me, he said it twice. First he says, don't be silent. Then he says, if you are silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. In other words, I die. God, don't be silent. If you are silent, I, I'd rather die. That's how close he was with God. And that is something that I really am deeply challenged by. Can I have such a relationship with God that if God is silent, it probes me to pray? Because that's what he did for David. He drove him. His heart was disturbed. God is silent. This is unusual. Is God angry with me? Why is he silent? Look what he did. In verse 2, this, this literally drove him. Hear the voice of my supplications. When I cry to you, when I lift up my hands towards your holy sanctuary, the word supplication would tell you how driven he was to pray not just once, not just twice, but non-stop. As long as God is silent, he is not going to stop praying. He's going to search God's heart, God's mind. Lord, why are you silent? Don't be silent. He would have said this I don't know how many times. That's what it is. On the, that's what supplication is. On the same topic, you keep on praying. You keep on asking, Lord, why are you silent? If you are silent, I'm, I'm done for. He's looking for answers. He's looking. He's trying to understand why God is silent. That caused him to pray. And he would lift up his hands. It's very symbolic. Towards the holy sanctuary. Now, we, uh, during this time, the temple of God was not built. But God has given to Moses the idea of the sanctuary, the tabernacle, was a physical place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. The Holy of Holies. And on the Ark of the Covenant are, is what they call the throne, the mercy of mercy, the mercy throne. 
It represents the throne of God. You see, prayer involves knowledge and understanding of God. And he would pray, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy, is it me? Have I done something that have caused you to be silent? It tells us such is this person's relationship with God. Look what he does. Look how he prays. There's sensitivity. These are the things we want to learn. Sensitivity. It takes closeness to have sensitivity. You know the person. If the person is silent, something is up. Is the person angry with me? Is the person troubled? Is the, what is it? Now, look how he searches his own heart. This is something we want to consider. Okay? In verse 3, he says to God, Do not take me away from, with the wicked. Now, this is something that we want to consider. He knows that God will not hear the prayers of the wicked. God will hear the prayers of the righteous. He loves the prayers of the righteous. He delights in the prayers of the righteous. But God will not hear the prayers of the wicked. And so he was concerned in his own heart, in his own life. Have he strayed to the path of the wicked that God is hinting to him, come back? See, you take nothing for granted. The danger is we take our relationship with God for granted. We think we're fine. We can stray and still think we're fine. It takes closeness to never assume, Lord, you're silent. Something's up. I want to search my heart. Don't, is it, take me away with the wicked. And then he searched further. And with the workers of iniquity. Now, what is the wicked? They do wicked things. They speak peace to their neighbors and evil in their heart. Right? You say nice things. Isn't it? Uncle, come. I say nice things to you. You are so good looking. And then, evil in my heart. You look like an orc. <laughs> that is evil. I would be guilty of this sin called wickedness. I speak peace with my neighbors, and I think evil of you in my heart. David knows this is considered as wicked. Give them according to their deeds, according to their wickedness. Give them according to the work of their hands. There we go. This is because, verse 5, they do not regard the works of the Lord. They have no respect for the holy things of God. They have no regard for the works of God. This is wickedness. And David needed to check his own life. Does he know how to regard the work of God? Does he know how to regard the holiness of God? Hence, he did not enter the holy of holies. He could only outside, hands lifted up, on his knees, have mercy. He want to make sure his relationship is right with God. And that is something we ought to do. If God is silent, there are lessons to learn. God's silence must never be ignored. And God is silent. He wants us to probe further. What are the things that ought to be learned? Self-examination. Am I, is my heart in the right place? Would I be carried away with the wicked? I'm not. Okay, I am not among the wicked. I want to make sure I'm not among the wicked. I want to make sure my heart, that's not, not evil, is there. Not hypocrisy. Not doing evil things. Speaking evil. Evil thoughts. I must be cleansed. These are lessons of prayer. How would God hear? Will he hear? Well, these are the lessons. What are the lessons that David learned as he, as he sought God here? Now, there were many lessons. I'm going to outline some of them over here. There are three lessons in particular if we were to look at this very closely. Okay, In Psalm 28, and one of the lessons is actually how he was driven to pray. The word is supplication. 
Sometimes we take prayer for granted. And, and God needs us to learn how to pray with a greater sense of effort, with a greater sense of faith that he will hear and answer. This is a lesson. Do we pray? Sometimes when God keeps quiet, okay, we pray further. We go on further. And that, that's an important lesson because when we don't, we become complacent. Okay, we just pray, God just hears. We can become very complacent. And so God needs us to learn how to battle this problem called complacency. Effort. You put effort into praying. You put effort into seeking God. You apply faith. Remember Psalm 25? On you I wait all the day. I go back to that lesson. I wait. I wait with faith. I wait with trust. One lesson is on prayer itself. Now, here is another lesson that must be learned. Sometimes we take God himself for granted. Okay, now, this is verse 1. We call upon the Lord and until we go through, Lord, I really need you to be there for me. And it, there's a bit of a delay. And you begin to appreciate, wow, God, you are truly my rock. There's nothing else. I can fall back on. Right? It is something that we must never take for granted. And that is our relationship with God. And yet, sinfully, we often take it for granted. David cried out to God, O oh Lord, my rock. In other words, my foundation. And sometimes in life we think, well, we've, we've made it. We're not struggling anymore. We are steady. You know, we live in Perm. There is no earthquake. There is... I found out that there's earthquake in Japan every day. I, I'm wondering, how do they live? They all prepared. They have typhoon. They have, and they have a very, very good system. They can rain for two days nonstop and no flood. If Perth rains for just two hours nonstop, we will have a flood situation. They're prepared. Why? They've gone through it. They've gone through time. They've gone through the duration. You're prepared. And when you go through life like this, okay, I can, I can understand this. Lord, you are rock. You are really solid rock. Okay? Rock, not fixer. Gloria, not fixer. God, David didn't pray, Lord, my fixer. There's a very big difference between God as your fixer and God as rock. He's there as a solid foundation. You are to stay close. He will protect you. He will shield you. But you got to be close to him, my rock. What else did David learn? He learned how to put his trust deeply in God. Look at verse 7. Verse 6, he says, Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. In other words, God has heard. Does God hear? Yes. But why did he keep silent initially? David, he will keep silent until David has learned the right lessons. And these lessons were now learned. He's learned to pray with greater strength. He can last. How long can you last? You pray. I'm so tired. I pray. Oh, God is not hearing. I get frustrated. You're either tired or you're frustrated. Both isn't good. He's sustained. Moses had to learn. Physically, he had to hold the staff. So tired that they had to put two stones on his hand. Lift up. Aaron and her was there. As, as long as his hands drop, they lose the war. When his hands are lifted, they win. So he had big biceps, you know. Because you watch, lifting up of those hands. It teaches, teaches us, can we even sustain prayer? How long can you sustain for? 
when you go through it, you have built up this thing called endurance. And all these things you need for life. Greater trust in God, greater sense of perseverance and endurance, we all need that. God knows that life is not going to be simple, that there's going to be free of problem, and so he provided us with the greatest gifts, prayer and the word of God, that we may be able to cope. Through these two things, if we were to use them, utilize them, we would find ourselves stronger. Look what he says. And he says, verse 7, the Lord is my strength. He's found strength. All right? The enemies were there, yes. Don't take me away with them. I'm not like them. I make a very clear distinction between me and those who are wicked. Don't, I'm not like them. But they will attack me, but I've got to be strong. And the Lord is my strength. Listen to these words. The Lord is my strength, right? He says, and my shield, my heart trusted in him, and I am helped. This was the lesson he learned. Trust. He learned to put his trust on God, a greater level of trust was needed for David. My heart trusted in God and I am helped. And I am helped. And he found that strength, he found that protection. God became his shield, God became his strength. And that's what trust does. When we wholeheartedly put our trust in God, the help comes as a result. This is actually a result. My heart trusted in God and I am helped. That's the result. When I put my trust in God, I am helped. God responds with strength to be given, with shield to protect. See, these were the lessons. David treasured these lessons and hence he wrote it down and made it a psalm to be remembered for himself first and for others to be blessed. These were the lessons. These were the lessons he learned. Now, if he didn't pray, he would have learned none of this. What is the outcome? What is God getting at? What is most needed is not so much the answer of prayer. We often look for just the answer. And we miss what God is wanting to help us cultivate. He needs us to cultivate very much a deeper faith. This is what is needed. Look at David's faith now. And he was able to say with great, greater confidence, the Lord is their strength. Verse 8, and he, he says, therefore my heart greatly rejoices. My song, I will praise him. There's just a sense of revival in his faith. And he says, the Lord is their strength, and he is the saving refuge of his anointed. Now he can tell people, the Lord is your strength. If you are his people, you trust him. He is your saving refuge. Look at his prayer. The last part is really his prayer. And he prays with greater conviction in what God can do. That's what faith is. Faith is, we now see the reality of God in life. The most natural response is that of greatness of joy in praising him. Faith is when we learn to depend on God, there is a greater sense of dependence on God. For his strength, the Lord is your strength. Do you need strength? I certainly need strength. Students, strength. Older ones certainly need strength. The Lord is their strength. And every passing year, we need more strength. Until Lillian Lau called me and she apologized for not being able to come to church today because she said she suffered a fall. She tried to rescue her dog. And then she fell down. And then she says, I think getting older and older. And 
and I you know, was glad I heard her voice, missed her for after 10 days, haven't seen her, talked to her for a while. Strength. I didn't know she fell down because she still sounds so strong. She was still saying, saying, praise God that you are safely back. The praise that is in her heart. Hey, you fell down. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know I fell down so, because I can't, so I can't come to church. She's quite bruised up. So, well, I've got to keep in touch with her. Strength. You don't know when you can fall down. When you're a young person, you fall down. It's okay. When you're older, you fall down. It's the end of the road. You break something. You go to hospital. Strength. We need strength to cope with life. And with greater conviction, he now prays. What can you do? Look at how he prays now. I, I like this prayer. Verse 9. He prays for others. This is what happens when your faith is strengthened. You pray for others. And he prays and he says, save your people. With great trust in God, God can do it. Bless your inheritance. Lord, save. Lord, bless. Lord, shepherd them also. Bear them up forever. This was the prayer I made for my daughter this morning as she turns eight years old today. I've watched her in, her in prayer for eight years. Before she was even born, she wouldn't know that her parents were praying for her. We take nothing for granted. After eight years of praying, do you still need to pray? Yes, with even need further strength to pray some more. My prayer for my daughter this morning, my special prayer was, Lord, save. Lord, bless her. Lord, shepherd her also be her shepherd i may not always be there for her but you would and you would shepherd her lead her as that good shepherd protect her bear her up forever this was that prayer for her this morning as i reflected on on her uh, as she celebrates her reflection my reflection a little bit different She's just happy she, celebrate, she can celebrate her birthday. But as I celebrate, I also celebrate one part with joy, one part with a bit more soberness. To look ahead at life and what life can be. The wicked will always be there. The battle against wickedness is a lifelong battle. It will always be the wicked. As long as sin and the evil one is in this world, there will always be the wicked. What do I need? I need a faith that is strong and deep. I need to be close with God. This is something that I am deeply challenged to do. To seek to be close, like David was close. That I can sense, Lord, if you are silent, you're either angry with me or you need me to learn deeper lessons. And I will probe further. That I will pray further. And see it through until you would speak until you would hear that prayer. And when you do, my heart will say, Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Does this psalm relevant to me? Absolutely. Is this psalm relevant to you? I hope so. May this psalm teach us many precious, rich lessons of drawing close to God, the lessons we need to learn about God, driven to pray, deep lessons to learn, a deeper faith as a result. May this be ours. May it be your blessing that you would experience the joy of the reality of faith at a deeper level. Let's pray together as we prepare for communion. Our Father, we pray this morning that you would teach us rich lessons of prayer, whether it's from the scriptures, whether it's from others, and very often a combination between the two, the experience of others and the truth that comes from your word. May we learn how to sense your silence and not ignore it, but to seek you in deep prayer, in deep concern, that perhaps you need us to learn a deeper level of trust. 
Perhaps you need for us to have a deeper level of faith too. May we learn them well. For our sake and our children's sake. That lives who need us to seek you in prayer will know that we will stand and pray for others too. And we pray that you would indeed save your people, bless your inheritance, shepherd them also, bear your people up forever. May we pray with greater confidence and faith in a God who truly hears and answers prayers. We pray that you would bless our hearts as we prepare for communion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts for communion this morning. Okay, let's take a look at this text. As we partake of the bread, we remember the words of the Lord where he says, and he took bread and he broke it. Look, look what he does. First, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. To the disciples, take, eat, this is my body. Prayer was so much a part of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He blessed, meaning he would have looked to heaven, conscious of God, pray a word of blessing, Lord, bless. This is so part of everything Jesus did. So as his disciples, this is the best way to learn, observe, follow. In all that we do, everything that we do, bring in that word of prayer. Is God there? He blessed, he broke as he prepared this. Take, eat, representing his body. That's how close the Lord Jesus was with God. He was that close. God's presence was with him all the time. This is something that we all need for life too. And so the hymn that I've chosen for us to sing is 393 that sings of a prayer. Nearer my God to thee. Nearer to thee. How near is God to us? Is he near at all? That we would sense his silence and pray further? David did. Jesus certainly did too. May we have this closeness with God. Let's think about this as we have the bread passed around. How wonderful it is to know that God wants us to draw near to him. Do we want to draw near God? For God delights deeply that he wants us to be near him that he does not want to be silent a minute longer than he needs to, to help us reach a level of faith that he needs us to be. Because he knows how, what is ahead of us, for we don't. He knows what's ahead. And he knows the level of faith we're going to need to cope. May we draw near him this morning all over again. May this be our prayer. Let's partake of this bread prayerfully. Our Father, we thank you that we can call upon you as our God, our rock, our redeemer, our savior, our friend, that we can draw near you in our time of need we pray that our hearts would be gladdened to know how much you desire for us to be near you. May we know the joy of knowing, experiencing the closeness of your presence. And we ask that you would bless us as we partake of this bread. May it help us to visualize that closeness of being partakers of the Lord Jesus himself. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
the next song I've chosen is a song that sings of how the Lord has provided for us to be near Him. And Jesus Himself was that provision. It is redemption that He gave to us. And it is also cleansing. It is sin that separates us from God. And without the cleansing of the Lord, we can never be near God. So God has to make every provision. And every time we partake of the cup, we are reminded that our redemption in Him is through the blood of the beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have full forgiveness of sins, that we can be near to God, we can be reconciled with Him, that when we call upon Him, that we, He would hear us as His children. This is made provided for by the Lord Jesus. May we seek Him every time for that cleansing. Let's sing this next song together as we have the cup passed around. Cleanse me. Well, let's partake of this cup prayerfully this morning. Our Father, we thank you so much the cleansing that comes from you, that you could cleanse us from the darkness of sin, that you would cleanse us of bitterness, that you would cleanse us of all the things that are evil, and you would fill our heart with your love, that we would always sense your presence with us, which we need so badly, so much. We thank you that cleansing comes through the Lord Jesus, in whom we can safely trust to be our Savior. And so we ask that you would bless our hearts this morning. Cleanse all who come to you with faith, with love, with trust. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's prepare an offering for the Lord's work this morning. We turn to our last hymn for our response. 372. If this has been made provided for God, from God, His Word, prayer, faith in Him, cleansing, to be made His people, how shall we live our life? Let's treasure life. Life is to be treasured. Life comes from God. I like this hymn. Live living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. This is a path that leads to the Lord's blessings. And may we know the great joy of experiencing the Lord's blessing when we can clearly see this path and walk on it. Let's sing this song together as our closing hymn. Let's rise as we sing all four stanzas, Living for Jesus. Let's ask that the Lord will bless us as we prepare to go from here this morning. And now may this great God of ours, who hears the prayers of the righteous, whom we are privileged to address as our Father in heaven, draw us close to himself. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ enable us to faithfully follow the Lord Jesus all the way to the very end of life. May the Spirit of God comfort our hearts and strengthen us to cope with all the challenges that may come in our life, that we will remain faithful to the God who has called us his own, now and forevermore. Amen.